Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is a joint venture from Resource Optimization Network and Solving Healthcare. And one of the things that are, we, our aim is obviously to empower other clinicians and uh, other frontline staff on how we could combat uh, COVID-19. And so we thought this is a great way of disseminating knowledge, you know, like to be able to have someone as high profile as Dr. Nella Povitz, um, to be able to speak to how we're really going to prepare for this. Like one of the main questions that I've gotten all the time is like, why aren't you anxious about how we're going to deal with this? And it's really the behind the scenes work that, you know, Dave and colleagues that have been doing to really get us going to get us uh, prepared. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm super excited to have him on the, on the, to do this webinar. Um, so to tell you a little bit about Dave, we've known each other at least since 2005 and he hasn't aged one bit. Um, he's the department head of critical care. He is the lead uh, for the provincial critical care task force for Eastern Ontario. So he's really uh, spearheading this e effort in our region. So without further ado, I got my boy, Na Dr. Dave Nilopovitz. Thanks, Quad. Um, you can see why we hired Quad, because he's sugarly sweet and knows how to butter all of us up. Um, we'll try to get through most of this, and we'll have some time at the end to try to answer some questions and do our best to try to share how we've been preparing for this, both from an Ottawa hospital, from a, a Department of Critical Care here, but also from the region. And I think no one in their right mind could be fully prepared for a pandemic, but we've had some strategies and approaches that has helped us get to a place that for the most part, we feel pretty good. Um, clearly you can't prepare for what happened to Italy or is going on in New York. But if anything, I, I feel we're better prepared uh, than they were, and we're going to share some of the strategies and some of the ideas that, that we did. So I think everyone remembers um, kind of when it began. I, I remember over the holidays uh, um, hearing about this virus that was going on in China. Um, I think you had some flashbacks of SARS and how it came from there and was wondering exactly what it what it was going to be and, and what its impact would be. I remember having the provincial meeting um, with my counterparts, so other leads from across the province for critical care. We talked about it. We didn't spend the whole time on it. But don't forget, we've been planning for a pandemic uh, since the SARS experience back uh, in the early 2000s. And we've had some kind of trial runs when H1N1 was coming, we were concerned that it was going to be more problematic than it ended up being. We also had a, a similar type of preparation going for Ebola. So it's not like we haven't been planning for a pandemic. Um, clearly, you can't plan to the extreme that uh, would be required if you were in Italy. But I would like to reassure everyone that there has been work on this for over a decade. And that, I, I do believe, is paying off. So for us, February is when it really started to become a little bit more real. Um, for us at the Ottawa Hospital, we were actually proactive. We started moving up some of our purchases. So some of our ventilators um, are at their end of life. And so what we were going to buy in October, we actually moved up. And so we were actually preemptive on that. We actually ordered some extra disposables that don't expire in, in such a manner that we would have them on hand even though uh, um, we were on the high end of our supplies. So very proactive with our respiratory therapy along with our nursing group. So excellent job in that. When did it really become real for me? Now, believe it or not, we were prepared to go to Florida as of the morning of March 12th. Um, I was in denial, and that is, that's one of the traps I'm going to talk about. I didn't think it would come this quickly, and so we were all set. We had tickets for five kids 
Uh, we had it all rented in Florida. And then we find out that morning uh, the Donald puts a 30-day travel ban from Europe. And realizing that this was spiraling out of control, um, that we need to, to make sure that our group was better prepared, um, as well as didn't want to get trapped down in Florida in, and deal with uh, an out of control situation. So we canceled the night before we were about to go to Florida. So again, denial is a big problem um, that, that sites and people are experiencing. And so you have to do what you can to avoid that. How do you prepare? Well, like I said, no one knows exactly how to prepare, but some of the strategies that, that we embraced had an underlying theme. And if you want to know what the theme was, that's the name of the talk, brace, pace, and embrace. So what does brace mean? How do you brace for impact? Well, what we tried to do was prepare for what we could. Um, like I said, we had already begun buying some products, uh, but we we're also trying to prepare with various strategies that I'll try to present um, and policies. We also had a, a plan to how could we mitigate for what we couldn't prepare for. And one of the examples of that I'll say is we now have a central intake for all patients requiring critical care for our, our area. So the idea being is we're gonna balance out all the admissions so one site isn't overrun as compared to uh, the other sites. So again, we can't prevent all the patients from coming, but we have a strategy to mitigate how they'll be distributed. The pace, there's two extremes that, that certainly we see. We see some who are going at 190 miles per hour, um, they're gonna burn out. This is likely to last for months. And, and so we need to pace ourselves. But there's also the group that almost don't get it. You, you, you can't wait. Um, I feel like I've become Captain Kirk in, uh, in Star Trek when Scotty says I need 72 hours and I tell him you got four. You know, this idea of, of telling people we got to move. We can't keep waiting. We can't wait till next week. Doesn't mean you want to have haste makes waste, but you can't wait. You got to keep moving and, and you'll hear that theme coming out. The final thing is the hardest thing that, that we've experienced is this idea of embracing change, embracing new ideas. Um, that's not easy. Um, that's certainly hard for a lot of people who are obsessive, compulsive, and control freaks. But you need to be able to embrace new ideas. So when I asked some sites, how are they going to use their anesthesia machines? When I got back, the answer is, well, we don't have enough um, human uh, resources to be able to do it, so we're not going to use them. The answer that I gave them was, well, forgive me, but I didn't ask you um, if you're going to use your machines, but rather how you're going to do it. We can't be nursing and staffing the same way that we did um, before COVID. So as Quad has heard me say on many times, there's a new timeline in, in the world of medicine. There's before COVID BC, and there's someday, hopefully there will be an AC after COVID. So you can't use BC management strategies when COVID is here. So you have to embrace new changes. The other thing people have to be aware of, some of the recommendations and things that we're putting out, they're going to change. They have to change. Um, and we're not going to get it right the first time. Um, and we recognize that. So every policy and, and protocol and, and recommendation we do, it's dynamic. We put a version code on it. We put a date because we know it's going to change. And, and it doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing. Um, you know, recommendations from public health, they change overnight. Um, but we're doing our best to adapt uh, and embrace new ways of doing things. Yeah, I'll just under just say something quick too, Dave, like, you know, this is obviously a, a time where, you know, it's, it's pretty intimidating and scary, but that whole embrace element of, you know, trying to be innovative and adapt, like some real good could come out of this, like approved ways of delivering care that allows us to be a little bit more efficient 
and uh, strategic. So not only is this, you know, uh, solution short term, but some, some of the stuff that we're going to develop here will actually be long term uh, solutions that will improve care. Couldn't agree more. Um, there will be a lot of changes in, in the new world once we get through COVID. Um, certainly, I know some people are keeping a list. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to be that uh, that type of person um, to that great extent. But there will be changes, and and we're learning a lot, and we're finding out a lot of things. Like let's be honest, our hospitals aren't at 110 percent capacity right now. But that's for another day. Um, let's focus back on COVID on how we're going to deal with COVID. So some of the strategy, strategies that our team is, has taken on, and it's not just me, it, it's a team. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. We set targets. And this is kind of what I alluded to earlier, some timelines and expectations. So for example, today, we have some drug recommendations on how to spare medications and utilize alternatives. That was set two days ago to come in today and, and, and to the individual's credit, it's arrived in my mailbox this morning. So set timelines. We will adapt and, and change them, but you got to start. You have to trust people. And that's really hard for, I, I see a lot of people to do. You have to trust. Uh, I have full faith in, in the people that I sign this, that, that he or she is going to do the best that they can and that they're, they're going to look at all sources and, and do their best to come up with the best recommendations and involve others. You have to trust. You can't be a micromanager. You can't do it yourself. It, there's just too much volume for that. Keep moving. Um, and that is, that's really hard. There, there is times where you get stuck on things, but you got to keep moving. Um, doesn't mean you ignore it. It doesn't mean you, you uh, avoid answering the, the issues, but you got to keep moving forward and watch for traps. And I'm going to allude some of the traps that we've experienced the hard way. Um, the first one, it's denial. I was in denial. Others are in denial. People, when we were recommending we're going to change X and Y, they're like, why? You know, I, I can't believe this is going to happen. Well, guess what? You know, denying isn't going to make it go away. So again, avoid the traps, keep moving. What we adopted was a form of incident management uh, system. I'm, I'm not an expert on this and I'm not going to profess that, that I am. And so me speaking to it um, probably won't do it justice. But we are using a type of variant for this. It, it allows us to have a framework on how we're going to respond. Our priorities are obviously are changed. You know, what was our priority before um, COVID is no longer our top priority. We're not ignoring what they were, but again, they've been reordered in priority. Um, I think an unfortunate example is how um, we cater to patients and their families. Uh, circumstances have, have put challenges on that. Doesn't mean that we're not trying to be, do our best to, to meet the needs of patients and their families. But at times, uh, other things now have to take greater priority, including the safety of staff and other patients, and, and even the patient themselves. How we're deploying our resources, be it our, um, our staff, be it our equipment, that's changing. Um, I think a good example of this um, will be our anesthesia machines. They're being redeployed in, in a different fashion um, should that become necessary. What are our goals? I, I think they're listed there. In, in spite of what some people may want to say, safety is our top priority. We can't have our staff and, and, and other uh, patients and other people being harmed by what we're doing. The PPE, that is a challenge for everywhere in the world. There's no place in the world that has too much PPE. So we want to make sure our, our staff has the, the personal protective uh, equipment that is appropriate. We want to use it uh, in a logical and reasonable manner uh, and we need to pace ourselves with it uh, and that's 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 a challenge 
and whatever we do, it needs to be feasible. Um, and again, um, that doesn't mean we're trying to compromise safety, but it's not just the safety now, it's the safety at all times and in the future. We're trying to minimize the impact of what we're doing on the community. We still have to have a level three, which is the highest level of intensive care, uh, for non-COVID patients. Uh, sites uh, like ours uh, here include neurosurgical patients. We have thoracic patients and cancer patients. They still need level three ICU. And so we need to be able to meet the needs of those patients as well as the needs of our region. How we do so, it has to be effective and it has to be efficient. Um, efficient can't be ignored. It doesn't mean you're compromising, but it has to be feasible and reasonable. And you can see the phases. Um, right now we're in the respond uh, phase. Someday hopefully we'll get in the recover and terminate. And as Quad has alluded to, someday there will be a debrief. What were the lessons we learned? How are we doing it? Well, one of the first and most important areas is the command and reporting structure. Um, now, I'm not a military person. I'm like Quad. I'm a lover, not a fighter. But we do need some type of reporting structure. Um, we need to delegate. And this is why I really think our group has been so successful. We've delegated aspects to our chiefs. We've delegated aspects to, to leads. I'm not following all the airway recommendations, and I'm an anesthesiologist. When I say I'm not following, I'm not creating them. I'll read them, I'll look at them when they're created, but I've delegated that task to someone else. Our region, you can see on the slide there, we break, broke up Ontario East into the LINs, which are various areas. We have three LINs for our area. And I have full confidence and faith in, in my colleagues in, in the Southeast LIN, which is by Kingston, and, and the Central East LIN, which is Scarborough and uh, Oshawa. I have to have faith in my colleagues that, that, that they can direct their area in a similar fashion as what we're doing here. So when we meet in, in our area, I have the, the chiefs of all the respective sites uh, for a, a call at, well, it was normally at 12 o'clock except for today, and we talk and see how things are going. So we share information, we text each other, so we have a good grasp of what's going on. We also have alternate. You know, I like to think I'm invincible, um, but clearly I'm not. I also like to think I'm infallible, um, but Quad, my kids, and various others will, will point out that I'm not. But we need alternates because we can get sick and at some point we'll need to take a break. The other component, which is another trap, is this mistrust is when you don't trust someone and you question everything they do, you undermine their confidence. I, I can't help but emphasize that you have to have trust in what's going on in the other, other colleagues and delegates that you create. We created a plan. Our plan for our hospital in our, our area um, had a tiered response. You can't go at 180 miles an hour right from the start. It doesn't make sense. So you can see we have four levels of how we're gonna gear up in response to COVID. Um, it's based on how many patients that we have, how many, um, our occupancy of our ICU. And so we have an idea of how we can increase our ability to provide level three ICU services. So not only do we know our plan, we've shared this plan with the hospital and, and the region and also the province. It's this communication with uh, other groups and services that needs to be essential. So whatever you do, you need a, a very effective liaison um, type of strategy with it. It's crucial and at times where we've had problems, it's because there's not been that sharing of what group A and group B is doing. Emerge has to coordinate with critical care. Critical care has to coordinate with 
with the medicine services, and everyone needs to, to be on the same page. Can't emphasize that enough. Communication, as I alluded to, is key. This is the uh, article, spurious article, that's making its way uh, through various people. We sit in a lot of meetings, um, and so there's this idea of too many meetings prevents us from being effective. I, I, I get it. Um, if there's too little meeting and too little communication, it creates a vacuum. And whenever there's a vacuum, people adhor it and they try to fill it. And so if you don't provide enough information, they're going to Facebook and CNN, they'll go to Quad's Twitter feed, they're filling it up if you don't provide enough information. If you send too much, you're overwhelming them and then they, they check out. So it's finding that, that Goldilocks balance of not too much, not too little. When we share the information, it has to be clear. And so what we do, we're using SharePoint. I can't say I love SharePoint, um, but it allows us uh, to share our information um, and it's clear. We have a table of contents so people can see when something was updated. They also can see what the latest version is and who is the individual responsible for managing it. I know you can't read it. I'm not, it's not there for you to read. It's, it's there to, to illustrate how we're doing it. The information is clear. So you have a title, describes what it is, when was it last updated, and if you have issues with it, who do you contact to, to ask for clarification or to make suggestions to. So for us, it's simple. Now, some would say, well, the order that the stuff goes in there is just by timeline. You're absolutely right. We don't have enough time to keep restructuring it. It was simple. It works for us. Um, as a friend would always say, enemy of good is better or perfection. You know, you have to have something that works for your team, accept it, and move on. People would want an app, but you know what? No one has the time to create an app. So keep it simple, uh, keep it effective, and make it clear and transparent. Final component is our team, okay? Our team is essential. Um, now, I'm not just doing this uh, uh, flippantly. If we didn't have the nurses, if we didn't have the, the, the residents, a lot of this would fall on its face. I'm doing a special shout out for the respiratory therapists, since this has such a heavy respiratory component. They need to be recognized for getting the equipment ready to get so much and adapt to so many changes in what we're doing. Our biomed department, they've serviced over 100 ventilators. Um, they're servicing ventilators that have never been serviced. We stole ventilators from our simulation center March 13th. You're saying, why weren't they serviced? They're, they're working on mannequins. There, there isn't a need to have them serviced and tip top the way we do for stuff that's in a intensive care unit on a regular basis. But the biomed department stepped up and they've serviced these devices and we're raring to go. The cleaning staff, you know what? They don't get enough credit. They're walking in and cleaning up the COVID rooms. Um, so take the time to speak with them, let, let them know what they're doing. The final person I, I need to recognize is the support staff that we have. Um, my admin has been working at times to nine o'clock at night updating and, and putting stuff on the SharePoint. And again, that, that stuff needs to be recognized. When we look at our region, how are we doing it? Well, the Italian experience recommended creating so-called hot hospitals or COVID hospitals. To be honest, that didn't seem feasible for us. We didn't feel we had the time. We didn't feel we had the size of a facility to be able to do that. So we also went with a balancing technique that we would all do our best to adapt to this. We do have COVID um, facilities, some would be transferring to them, but for the most part, we're balancing it. How are we making that work for us? As I alluded to earlier, we have a central intake. So all the critical care patients, we find out what's wrong with, with the patient and we determine which of our six sites is the most appropriate 
for that individual to go. We base it on the patient needs, the occupancy, and what a site can provide. So we're trying to make sure that we are there to provide care for all the patients in, in our area, but also we're there to ensure that the staff at all of these sites um, are sharing the burden um, and so that we can get through this together. How could we manage COVID for our ICU? Well, one of the most important things we, we recognized was resource management. I've never had so many people ask me about ventilators as I have in the last month. People who probably didn't even know what a ventilator was are asking, do we have enough and things as such. Yes, we're, we're certainly getting there. Um, we have taken all our, what I'm calling respiratory assist devices or RADs. We, repurposing different types of devices. What you see on the screen, that's a disposable ventilator. Um, that was a Y2K version. We had them in the basement. God love uh, the people who knew they were in that box in the basement. We took them out. We had over 200 of these and we've shared those with all our sites. Is that as good as a, a $20,000 ventilator? Obviously not. But these devices will be out there to help temporize um, to allow sites to be able to provide care until we can get them into our more formal level three ICUs. So we're using what we have and we're adapting what we have to, to help meet the needs. Other equipment, the monitors, um, pumps. What wasn't known was, uh, was one of our campuses was kind of shut down for March break, started taking all the beds and, and the pumps and you know sending them out to other sites so that it could be used. So again, you have to find where your resources are and utilize them to the best of your ability. I'll give credit to Mike, one of our, our nurse educators. He knew that the defibrillators were recently decommissioned. He reached out and we got them to come back. And so they're not going to be used as defibrillators, but they're going to be used as a form of monitor. So think outside the box. Use things in a different way. Repurpose stuff. Your disposables, you got to be smart with how you use it. Um, you have to be effective and efficient. Um, but again, there's also ways of repurposing other aspects. Probably what's going to become a big issue, as it's certainly surfacing, is medication shortages. And that's why Two days ago, we said, look, we're going to re get out some recommendations on how we can conserve and, and have alternates. We've got that coming out. And again, we realize we're going to have to revise that. The ethical issue that's there, and that's a whole topic in of itself, the, the fallacy of first come, first serve. Um, that's a, a difficult concept for everyone to accept sometimes. But again, if you do everything right now, you may not have anything left in a week from now or a month from now or two months from now. So you have to keep that concept in, in mind with whatever you're doing today. So remember, there are more patients who are gonna come. What is the best strategy for everyone, regardless of what time they arrive? Policies and best practice. We have been starting on that from, from mid-March and we're continuing it to today. We have procedures um, and we'll go through some of those. We have PPE strategies. How are we gonna distribute the ventilators? That's something the province keeps working on and revising. If you don't address an issue uh, before it's an issue, it's gonna come on you and then you're gonna be struggling to, to catch up. So you can't avoid it, that's another trap is avoidance. Critical care triage, that's a very difficult topic uh, for everyone to embrace. The idea of if your resources are limited, how do you use them? This may cause some patients not to re be able to receive all the resources that another patient receives. Those are difficult decisions. Those are terrible things that have happened in Italy and in New York and I hope that doesn't come here, um, but you need to have a strategy on how you're gonna deal with it should it, it arise. Now, the good news is we're moving forward. Um, fixation errors, 
certainly experienced that where you get caught up in one issue. You need to do your best to get past it. We've experienced it. It's actually taught us a valuable lesson and that's how you have to keep moving forward on a regular basis. So we're going to get into some examples um, and I'm happy to you know talk with whoever and whatever but th these are some of the strategies and things we did to to address our COVID issues. How did we increase capacity by nearly 300 percent for our level three ICUs? Well first and foremost our plan will involve doubling our rooms. Now people say well you're not supposed to do that. Well I get it. In the BC time, you wouldn't double in a room, but when you have potentially hundreds of patients coming, you have to adapt. So what have we done? We've maintained the mandatory six feet spacing between the beds, as you can see in, in, the, in the picture there, but it allows us to double things up. So you have two ventilators in a room. We have a second monitor. Um, you can see it in the background here. Our other strategy would be to bring an anesthetic machine in there that gives you a ventilator and a monitor uh, for the second patient. So we're able to do so. It entailed a lot of challenges, uh, both equipment and ventilators, but also space. You're not going to be able to have as much space as you're used to, but you still have the mandatory six feet between beds. The support for suction and gas and electricity. I'll show you some pictures in, in, in a second there, how we address that. So you have to know what you can do to double your capacity. Electricity loads. Now we're fortunate that this is a newer part of the hospital. You have to talk to your engineers and find out what electricity loads that your rooms can handle. How are you going to staff it? That is a huge issue. You know, Normally in a level three ICU, the nurses are essentially one nurse to one patient. When you get into the higher numbers, there's no way that can be maintained. We'll be moving to more of a one to four, but that doesn't mean that you can't get other staff to come and help. So we'll have other nurses, like non-ICU nurses, help out our, our their ICU colleagues. We'll also have additional um, patient um, advocates, um, orderlies, and, and, and various other um, therapists coming to help us. So you have to have a strategy. Did I come up with these strategies? No. I delegated that to the nurse managers and the assistant managers. They've worked on this tirelessly uh, to come up with ways to mitigate it, and they deserve the credit for it. But you need to be able to say, how are we going to staff it? It can't be the way you traditionally staff. You have to learn new ways to staff. When you bump into new areas, if we're going to go into our recovery room, should it come to that stage? Where do the patients who normally go to recovery go? We found them a spot. We, we walk in the hallways in, in, the, in the hospital. So they're going to go to the surgical daycare area. So you have to have strategies. What are you going to do with the areas that you bump into? Did we use our operating rooms? No, we're not going to put our patients in the operating rooms. That's not a part of our plan. Part of the reason being is, yes, it's positive pressure and, and that's the opposite of typically what you would do. But more importantly, you can't staff it the same. It's easier to staff it. You can see the patients closer together. In an operating room, you probably can only get two patients, maybe three patients. It didn't work for staffing and so that's why we chose not to do it. How are we doing it? As I alluded to, you can see our, our suction is bifurcated. You see this thing here where the arrow is? They're in short supply, so you'll see how we address that problem. We made our own. You can see bifurcating the gas supplies. One of the big issues is not every area has medical air. And so some of our areas, if we were to put ventilators there, there wouldn't be enough airports uh, for the devices. Our solutions, some of the ventilators don't require it. So wherever we don't have enough air, we're going to preferentially put our ventilators that run on pure oxygen only. Um, they have an internal compressor to bring in air. So you have to know what your machines require and how you can adapt it. 
For us, we have our recommendations on our SharePoint, and we're happy to share with whoever and whatever. You have to have strategies. You can see here is those decommission um, defibrillators. There's no paddles. You can't use it as a defibrillator, but we're going to use it as a monitor. You can read it. It says monitor use only. So have strategies on how you're going to make your rooms work. Probably one of the biggest issues with COVID, um, and that hopefully will be discussed at some point in the post-COVID period, is the need for airborne for a disease that we've been told by WHO is droplet. I'm not going to get into that too, too much, um, whether or not there's actual aerosolization uh, during procedures. Um, the evidence is a bit mixed. Um, there is some that, that goes in the air, but whether or not that's infectious, that's for another group to, to discuss and debate. What have we done is we've created our airborne procedure rooms, APRs. There's no facility in the world that would have enough airborne rooms for the number of COVID patients that, that most sites are going to experience. So we adapted. We came up with a strategy to mitigate that. So what we did was took one of our airborne rooms and we took everything out of it. Um, I don't know if the picture on the right does it justice, but everything that we could take out was taken out. We took off the TV where there's no curtains. So when it's clean, it's quick and easy. We did our best to take everything off of the, what's called the glide scope for video laryngoscopy. Whatever we could take off is taken off. You don't want cleaning to be challenging. What do we have right by it? We have our airway intubation uh, shields. I'm not sure they're, they're a perfect um, and make things better, but people felt that it would help them in their personal protection and therefore they're available for those who want to use them. We also have our equipment right outside. Um, our, we have our airway um, boxes, and I'll talk to that shortly. If we were to do a bronc, which I hope we'll never do a bronc in our COVID patients, we would do it in this room. So again, we have the ability to, to, to maximize our, our airborne rooms, and so we've created these APRs, not just in the ICU, but they're in the wards right by the COVID um, patients. Our intubation strategies. This has one of the, been one of the most challenging areas. Um, we tried to come up with a simple, easy to reproduce, easy to keep the stock going with minimizing waste. So we're going with an airway box strategy. So the first box is open for every patient. The box two and box three are as if there's problems that arise. They're immediately available. Don't forget, if you open the box, Everything that's in it is pretty much got to go in the garbage can. You're going to run out of resources if you bring everything in right from the start. So we came up with a strategy to minimize our waste. Um, again, remembering that this may go on for weeks or months. And supplies, look, the whole world's trying to get supplies, so you have to be strategic in how you do it. Um, we have three boxes for us, basic intubation, some advanced techniques and a, finally a surgical technique. We uh, were utilizing something called a fluso valve for better or for worse. Um, why are we using it? We don't want our ventilators in our airborne rooms. We don't want to contaminate it. So our strategy was to not bring the ventilator in the room. We're using this to be able to safely transport the patient to where they're ultimately ventilated. So again, have we revised it and will we likely revise it? Probably, but again, we have a strategy to try to mitigate the circumstances and be effective, but also be efficient. Big thing that hopefully will become an issue, and I say hopefully, uh, because you want to hope that we're going to extubate a lot of these COVID patients, so we've come up with an extubation algorithm. Um, part of it's on the screen there you know, telling us how are we going to do it? What is our strategy? How are we going to be prepared to reintubate if that's appropriate? Again, some of the other things that we're creating, um, we've created a type of mask that allows us to have oxygen titrated from 21% to 90%.
but when they expire, um, they're expiring through a HEPA filter so that we're protecting the staff around them. These will be coming out very soon, very shortly. Um, we have the step-by-step -step on how to do it. Um, so again, we're trying to come up with ways to protect the staff, but also best meet the needs of our patients. And so we're working on that and we'll continue to revise that. And sites are encouraged to do the same. You need to know how you're going to intubate them, how are you going to extubate in a safe manner. Repurpose, reuse, rediscover. Now my anesthesia colleagues are, are probably thinking I'm a, a, a trader as an anesthesiologist taking the machines, but we have a strategy of how we're going to use those machines if it comes to that. That's not a real patient, I know. Uh, that's the simulation lab but look at all the stuff they had that was valuable for us. They got pumps, we took the pumps, we're taking the machines, they have monitors, not in this picture, but they have uh, uh, ventilators for different scenarios. Whatever we could take, we did take. We've also welcomed stuff from our colleges. So the first week after March 13th, we were calling both our, our respiratory therapy colleges to get their devices and made arrangements to get those in, and they were so generous to give that. As I alluded to earlier, rediscovering things. Those Y2K ventilators in the basement, they're back back as an option. So we've sent those out, uh, sent them to all our sites in our area. We even sent some up to the north, um, to Thunder Bay. Uh, so again, trying to help others, and they're trying to help us. We've ordered more had to go through Health Canada who in record fashion gave us approval. They're coming from the states and I'm not sure they'll come because of the Donald, but we're doing what our, we can to get more and to, to, to make sure that we're as best prepared as possible. When resources are short, you have to do what you can. Now, Quad, I know you're recording this and I hope that doesn't put me in jeopardy or others in jeopardy, but Let's be honest, the supply simply can't keep up with the demand. So on the right here, the blue ones are the ones that our 3D group have made. These are the suction catheter bifurcation things that we did. They work fantastic. They were able to, to make 50 in a night. Uh, again, um, I don't know what the patent laws are. We're not selling them. We're just meeting the needs of our patient. The glide scopes, we're reproducing them. Uh, I'm trying to make them as perfect as possible. This ugly dude is, is sampling the non-rebreather that's filtered. There is a special mass that's called the high ox that you put a filter on it. Guess what? The whole world wants them. They're in short supply. We're doing our best to adapt what we can. This took us uh, five minutes to make. And again, it filters it out. Uh, so replicate what you can. Um, Adnan is my 3D friend. He's making stuff, and, and it's wonderful how the community has reached out and offered to help uh, and produce stuff. So we're, we are meeting the needs as best we can, and we're not afraid to, to try new things. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, we're pushing the envelope. Um, these hoods on, on the left, there is a type of CPAP helmet that, that's been produced and was was considered to be highly effective in Italy. It decreased the number of intubations, which to be honest, the evidence is suggesting not everyone needs to be intubated, and more importantly, is potentially harmed by intubation. So we're coming up with our, our strategy on the right there to try to um, decrease, try to mitigate the number of patients being ventilated. But how are we gonna provide the care they require? Again, we're trying to make these helmets. Ironically, the helmets come from Italy. Guess what? Italy's not sending any of these helmets out to anyone, so you have to adapt. The ones on the top there aren't the Italian ones. This is what they're making in Ohio. Um, they weren't making that before COVID. They released it and said, this is how we're doing it. Giddy up, go do it. So we're seeing what we can um, do. We'll be working with Health Canada if we get it going. Our trial works surprisingly well, um, and there's two ways. This is a simple one that we just used with a Venturi setup going in. 
with a peep valve, that's the red thing, with an adapter. You see the yellow thing? We 3D printed it. It worked incredibly well. It's filtered. It's protecting uh, those around us, the staff, as well as meeting the needs of, of the patient. The scuba mask, you're going to see that out. So this version, this version is to do BiPAP. I was actually surprised how comfortable it was. That's me um, giving it a try. We have to, we'll have to adapt the front uh, because it's a, a valve, but that's easily done. You pop it out and flip it around apparently. Um, I'm too stupid to know how to do it, but it, it, it worked. It was quite comfortable. The leak was very minimal. Um, there's a variant of this where instead of having the two ports, they come to one and you actually put a, a, a filter on and that's being used as PPE. We're, we're trialing it. We're going to see if we can get it going. We're not afraid to, to think outside the box. So remember, um, to brace and pace and embrace, uh, it sounds corny, but it, it's, it's working for us. You got to set your targets. You got to trust people. Um, people are delivering. I'm so impressed how people are doing it. Keep moving. Avoid the traps when you can. Happy to discuss things with your quad and whoever. Dave, that was tremendous. I, I think this is exactly why when asked, we are comfortable saying that we are prepared. We are um, steps ahead of where we where people were in, in terms of New York and um, and Italy and why we say, you know, fairly comfortably that we're not going to be in that predicament. Um, I guess maybe with the first question I'll ask before uh, taking um, questions from the audience is meant, do you, how do you feel? Like, do you feel with these measures that are in place, are you, are you confident that we're prepared to deal with whatever is in front of us? I'm confident we're as best prepared as, as we could likely be. I, I don't know if any site could ever deal with the Italian situation. Like, let's be honest, the social distancing, you know, has certainly had a, a huge impact. But remember, social distancing spreads it out. It doesn't prevent the problem, it spreads the problem out. And so by spreading it out, these measures we've done, I feel we can deal with, with pretty much what's likely to come. We'll never be perfect, but we are certainly better off than many, many areas. So, yes. And uh, maybe let's uh, get rid of the uh, presentation. Like, um, can you get, stop sharing screen? Beautiful. Okay. Um, excellent. I'll, if there's any questions out there, you could either type them, or uh, I could attempt to let people open uh, open it up to the audience. There was a question that was already I, I believed you answered, but I'm just gonna bring it up in case just to double check. Um, some resources, for example, Singapore suggests se uh, sequestering COVID patients into specific institution. Is there an option for this in Ottawa, like Montfort or Queensway? We looked at it, um, and I, 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 I wish we could. I, I don't think we had the time to be able to take the patients that was in an existing hospital and move them to another uh, center, which would really have been important. Um, the Montfort and the Queensway are, have done a fantastic job, but they, they certainly wouldn't have the volume, um, the capacity to handle all the potential ICU patients. So good question. I wish we could. Um, but I don't think we had the time. And our geography isn't the same as if you were in one big city. I know Ottawa is the predominant, but um, it, it, we had to make a decision, right or wrong, and, and we decided to share it. Um, so, uh, so no, no, it, we didn't have the capacity. And it's everywhere now. It's all in the community. So I yeah. think we, it's too late um, anyways. It was too late by the time we realized anyways. Yeah. All right, uh, I, Dave, I don't know if you see these questions, but I'm just going to go in order. So Arifa, 
Rauf is asking, what are your thoughts on projections put out by Ontario Health? Um, projections are projections. They're only as good as the data going in, in, in the circumstances. I think a lot of those are presenting worst case scenarios. Um, we're scared to say that things are looking more promising than, than the projections because we don't want to jinx it. Everyone's superstitious. Um, I, I think things are better off than what the projections are, and I think we'll be able to meet the needs of patients throughout Ontario, uh, barring a second wave. If people stop social distancing, then then we'll be in store for potentially not being able to meet the needs. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to Christina's question. Um, have you seen success in using high flow nasal cannula for patients with low oxygen sats breathing comfortably and avoiding intubation? How long do patients tend to stay on high flow nasal cannula? Yeah, there's a lot of speak of this on social media actually. And I, I can speak for myself personally. I haven't had enough exposure to patients in this, like presenting this way, but um, I don't know if you've had exposure yet, Dave. Well, Personally, no, but our sites have. So we have had success. Um, we had several patients at the general campus who weren't intubated, who were put on high flow nasal cannula um, for to about three to five days and were successfully weaned off and some actually went home. Um, the idea of proning awake, so well on the nasal cannula, uh, the high flow, the air, air bows and the various other models, yes. So the answer is yes, there has been success, and that's why we're pursuing it. I, I think the question, though, I, 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 that I have seen, but there's some, there's a, like there's a picture on, on Facebook or Twitter of somebody t uh, texting with sats of 58% um, while on, I'm assuming on high flow. She's in a prone position too, actually, which for those that are non-super medical, lying on your stomach. Um, but that I haven't, I have, I haven't had exposure to that. You know exactly. You know I've not having my I've been doing a different position of the last couple of weeks. Um, but again, there. If you go to our site and things like that, you'll see there's different phenotypes that are being described. Uh, there's some that are the very severe respiratory issues, like very somewhat similar to traditional ARDS. But there's that group that that Quad is is discussing where. They're hypoxemic, but they seem relatively tolerating it. And what is the best strategy for these individuals? That's what uh, sites around the world are trying to clarify. But potentially intubation may not be the right thing to do in all of those patients. Beautiful. Um, the questions are coming fast and furious. So we're going to try and be brief, Dave. Um, uh, are, are you staffing? <clears throat> Excuse me. Are your staff wearing N95 in rooms where high flow O2 is being used in addition to usual PPE? So, good question. A very challenging issue. We're very reluctant to use BiPAP ventilation. Um, if we use BiPAP for any patient, we're using full PPE N95s. In terms of high flow oxygen, um, at present we are um, using N95. My personal bias is, is that I don't think that's required. But again, um, we're doing everything we can to ensure the safety of staff. So, so that, um, that option is certainly available for staff. In terms of variance in between, it, it, it would be a cross between it, depending on the specific form of high flow oxygen. Okay. Um, here's a quick one too. Where are you keeping the happy hypoxic patient? or hypoxemic patient? In ICU, question mark? They'll be going to the ICU for the time being. Um, it, it becomes a question of numbers. That that's, that's the biggest thing. We're not trying to use, for those who don't know, a level two intensive care unit tends to not ventilate but have more monitoring. We made a decision to not use too much level two for COVID. Um, and so the answer is they would be going to the ICU. Uh, for the um, time being. Okay. Um, okay. 
Are staff at your site using N95 or surgical masks with visors for compressions only before intubations during protected code blues? Yep, the code blue, that, that, that's one of those, we do have our recommendations, the idea is N95. We made a decision um, a week, week and a half, two weeks ago to put LMAs in. And, and that's one of the ones that people haven't been as receptive on saying, well, it's not as effective as, as formal intubation. The difficulty is to get everyone um, into an airborne room to get a glide scope, it was just not feasible. So that's why we went with the LMA. Uh, so are they doing chest compressions? There, there's a sequence where they put a mask on the patient, um, the staff then puts on full PPE, and, and there's a progression of it that, that's described in, in our, our protected code blue, which to be honest is what we're using now for all patients. Um, I hope I answered that question, but they're not being intubated unless they recover and we're able to get them to one of our APRs. Beautiful. Okay, can you describe the adverse effects of ventilation in COVID patients that are trying to avoid, that we are trying to avoid by not intubating? What's the natural course of this condition for a patient on a ventilator? That that that's a long. I, I can't do that. I can't do it justice in yeah, thirty that's a, seconds. Sorry. Right yeah. My, my, but, my, but there's some. There's an excellent webinar uh, from the European Society um, that if you reach out to us, we'll be happy to share it. But the challenge is that they they're breathing too deep and too much, um, and there is some potential for causing um, lung injury to themselves. Uh, in terms of how do they progress, some recover. And then there is a, a, a subpopulation that worsens, um, and that is a, a very concerning uh, situation. There's not clear on how you identify them. There's certainly a component of, of thrombosis, and we're obviously exploring prophylactic anticoagulation in them. But I, I, unfortunately, I can't do that justice in 30 seconds. Yeah, and I, I'm a, I'm starting to become a believer of the uh, anticoagulation. By the way, just from my limited experience. I'm gonna do one last one, just I think, cause I think we could do this one quickly. When do you anticipate we see our first influx of patients into, into ICUs? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, when the projections for saturation in the province was supposed to be April 4th, uh, the expectation would be ICUs would be roughly about five to seven days after that. Uh, saturation being the in the community, and then there's a bit of a delay for what would come to the intensive care unit. We, we're past those dates, okay? In, in certain areas, the north would be delayed compared to, to the GTA, and I think Ottawa area would be delayed compared to, to the Toronto area. We're keeping an eye on it. Um, the, like I said, the numbers are, are, are holding steady. The increase uh, had been about 8% um, per day, um, today is a good day. And now we don't necessarily know if that's a real trend, but let's see how things go. So we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that, that it's starting to go down, but you know, I'm not supposed to say that out loud because it'll jinx us. So in answer to the question, <laughs> we don't know. You're a powerful man if you could, by your words, you could impact uh, such a massive future. Um, listen, everybody, I really want to thank, number one, our guest speaker and Resource Optimization Network member, David Nelipovich, for this. This was extremely valuable. And, um, and I, I got to commend you too, Dave. Like, I know this is a job that is at many times thankless. And I, I, could, say, I could say personally, I wouldn't want to uh, be in your spot right now, but it is everything, you know, and when, when we're able to go and tell our colleagues and our neighbors and our friends that, you know, we're doing all we can to be ready for this, this is absolutely positively true when you see the work that's being put in. So I want to commend you and I, I want to thank you. And we might have to do this again based on the uh, number of questions we didn't get to. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Anytime. Thanks Happy again, guys. I hope, hopefully we'll do this again soon. And we'll send out a, we'll have a heart, uh, recorded version of this as well. Thank you.